often threatens to infect me with self-destructive ideas. It tells me that I have simply drawn the genetic short straw and was cursed with blackness, an unfortunate quality that makes me something less than a human being. I've always loved words. Their power and nuance made them incredibly versatile tools of expression. Every word has different connotations, associations, shades of meaning when viewed from different perspectives, a complexity that can be as destructive as it is beautiful. Take the word black, for example. In a dictionary, it is simply the absence of visual light. In my mind, it is a part of my identity and that of my family. In a mind left vulnerable by ignorance and corrupted by hatred, however, it is a dirty word, representative of something lesser, something other, something that should be met with derision and repulsion, fear and hate. These associations flash through a person's mind almost instantaneously, but they arise from a predetermined set of beliefs, the framework for what we call prejudice. This was what I had experienced at work, what I feel when I notice cautious eyes following me through a room, or when I hear someone speak slowly as to a child when addressing me. These issues are almost endemic to the society we live in. However, that doesn't make speaking out futile or unnecessary. This fall, my school's mock trial team, a club I help lead, worked to raise money for the Ohio Innocence Project, an organization that provides legal representation for unjustly imprisoned individuals, a disproportionate number of whom are black. Through the fundraiser, I engaged in meaningful conversations with classmates and staff, finding that everyone had much more common ground than they expected. I believe that once we educate others and reinforce our shared humanity, we can do away with much of the ignorance, bigotry, and hatred that plagues us as a society. While this is much easier said than done, the pursuit of this goal is well worth the work it entails. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel, and thanks to the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage for always bringing these extraordinary young people to our forum and to share their powerful and poignant words. Okay, we're getting close to when we need to start the forum, so what I call the usual stuff, if you have a, more, a mobile phone with you, please be sure to take it out and make sure it's on silent or vibrate as we are recording for both WCPN 90.3 and WVIZ PBS, but feel free to leave it out and engage with us on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. The pertinent social media information is located inside your printed program. Um, the second half of the forum is powered by your questions. The first 30 minutes will feature Afi and Ershad engaging in conversation. Um, second half is your questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and one of our microphone holders will um, come over to you. We ask that you stand if you are able to so our cameras can find you and can zero in um, on your question. And please do not take the microphone from the, uh, the mic holders. They know where to hold it so we can accurately capture your voice. Um, City Club is in the middle of one of its most uh, chaotic times. It's sort of raining City Club forums right now. Um, in addition to being here during the day, we are at the Cleveland International Film Festival in the evening, putting on uh, nine City Club forums after certain documentaries. So if you're a film festival fan or are planning on going to the festival this weekend, please check out our film forums and come um, see us at the movies. Um, I think that's, uh, did I forget anything, anyone? Um, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to get started in just about four or five minutes. If there's someone at your table you have not met, please introduce yourself now. Um, and thank you for being here.
going to tell me when to start. I'll, ta uh, yeah, oh, I'll, tell tell you, I'll tell you from back there. I'll give you the signal for standby and I'll give you the point when okay. it's time to go. So it'll be pretty soon after I get over here. <laughs> but I mean, after oh, they've talked afterwards. a while and it's time for questions? Yeah, she'll tell you. She She's coming back. She's probably grabbing her plate. Okay. Oh, there she is. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland for one of our regular forums. I'm Dick Pogue, a former president of the City Club, and it's my distinct privilege today to introduce our speaker, Urshad Manji. She's here in Cleveland as a guest of uh, the Reverend Bill Green, a retired UCC minister and a member of Plymouth Church of Shaker Heights. Urshad Manji has provoked a fierce reaction around the world with her provocative call for reform of Islam. It's a religion of which she is a devout member. She has broadened her philosophy in recent years <clears throat> uh, beyond Islam to become a critic of the so-called politics of moderation, or groupthink, as she calls it. She decries that in what she calls these times of moral crisis. This broadened philosophy in turn, led her in 2008 to start a movement called the Moral Courage Project. That's an activity which she advances from her <clears throat> current teaching position at the University of Southern California and her home in Hawaii. She defines moral courage as the willingness to speak truth despite disapproval from one's own community. In other words, doing the right thing in face of your fears. Urshad, whom, to whom uh, Oprah Winfrey gave the first annual Chutzpah Award for audacity, nerve, boldness, and conviction, <laughs> grew up in Vancouver, Canada. Her parents were of Egyptian and Indian descent, and the family had uh, emigrated to Canada 
from Uganda during Idi Amin's <coughs> 1972 purge of the country's Indian minority. This was said to be a very traumatic experience of Muslims brutalizing Muslims. As a young student in Vancouver, she was kicked out of her Islamic school by the Imam because she asked so many questions. She then went to public school and found a much more open environment and an opportunity to ask whatever she wanted to ask. Subsequently, she received a bachelor's degree in the history of ideas with honors from the University of British Columbia. Her first book was published in 2004, and its title was The Trouble with Islam Today, A Muslim's Call for Reform in Her Faith. It was so impactive that she received a number of death threats afterwards. Her second book was published in 2011. It also had a long title. Allah, Liberty, and Love, Courage to Reconcile Faith and Freedom. And it was based on the Quran's precept of ijtihad, the right to think independently. <clears throat> she asserts that the Quran contains three times as many verses promoting critical thought as opposed to blind submission. Her books are banned in some countries and are great bestsellers in other countries. So now she has a third book just published this year entitled Don't Label Me, An Incredible Conversation for Divided Times. It's a conversation of, uh, between Urshad and her dog Lily in which she tells Lily, and here I'm quoting, when we let labels stand for people, we end up manipulating people. It's a provocative take on how to heal the polarization that seems to be ripping apart the United States and other parts of the world. And as she said about her own new book, she's taking a lot of flack for it, but also generating great excitement. She'll be discussing it today. Urshad spoke here at the City Club back in 2012 and received great acclaim for her comments at that time. And so we're very proudly welcoming, welcoming her back today without labels. <laughs> Joining Urshad on stage today is digital storyteller and former plane dealer reporter, Afi Scruggs. Her diverse, work of, uh, her diverse body of work spans 30 years, and then she has appeared on a variety of platforms including the Washington Post, the New Yorker, uh, Cleveland Magazine, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and so forth. She has twice been a finalist for the Press Cl Club of Cleveland's Best Freelancer in Ohio Award. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Chicago and a doctorate from Brown University. So ladies and gentlemen and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Urshad Manji and Afi Scrudge. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Usually I ask the audience to applaud themselves for being here, so why don't you give yourselves another <laughs> round of applause <laughs> for being here and taking part in this very important conversation. And I hope at the end of the afternoon and the end of the event that you will do more than have listened, that you will have come up and be inspired to do something about some of the events that we do have. We are going to talk about some of the situations. Ershad, you wanted to talk to Well, it. first and foremost, thank you to the City Club for uh, re-inviting me. I thought I might have gotten kicked out of this school, not just my religious school back in 2012, but um, glad to see that that wasn't quite the case. Um, and thank you so very much to Mr. and Mrs. Pogue who have been great supporters of the City Club, but who have also been great supporters of me and the idea of moral courage. Um, I, uh, one of the reasons I love coming back to Cleveland is precisely because I get to see them. And uh, I want to say one other thank you, which is to the friends who are here today. Um, our friendships have developed over many, many years, um, but I love the fact that we stay in touch, and I also love the fact that today we have a special delegation from Akron, Ohio. Friends of my wife, 
who in turn have become friends for life. So thank you all. Um, and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, how to heal the polarization that, as Dick mentioned, is ripping apart these United States. I, I'd like to clarify one thing right off the top, which is that you know, some of what I say, at least, may come off as a little idealistic. But I want you to know that I am supremely aware that segregating ourselves as human beings into us and them is actually a biological reality. It is what our brains do. I'm by no means suggesting that there will be hand-holding harmony anytime soon, if ever. But I think the distinction I want to make right off the top is that us and them does not have to become us against them. That's the core distinction. And with that, I'll turn it over to my uh, interrogator slash co-conversant. I, I don't think I'm all that. But I do want to start off with a question about the book, because as I was reading through it, it dawned on me that there's a cultural misunderstanding that I think, in order to get um, really the importance of the book, is that you are talking to your dog. And in the, in the um, introduction, you talk about how Islam looks at dogs. And so could, I t could you talk briefly about how in framing the book as a conversation between you and Lily, you are breaking free of a label and actually I guess, uh, confronting or challenging the religion that you hold so devoutly. Yes, a, a, a brilliant insight right off the top that even in making this a conversation with Lily, I'm conveying to Muslims who pick up this book that we do not have to fear dogs. Let me explain. Not all Muslims, but many Muslims, myself included, are raised with a cultural uh, bias, a cultural fear against doggy kind. We are told that dogs are what is known in Arabic as najis, which means dirty. And dirty not just physically, but, but spiritually. In fact, I was told by the same so-called teacher who booted me out of the madrasa that, um, that if I got near a dog, not only would I be bitten and therefore physically harmed, but my soul would, would rot and I would never get to heaven. So you can appreciate that um, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when you're told this a number of times, as a child, you have a tendency to believe such things. Well, it took a very long time for me to transcend that fear. Um, and in fact, one year, I had a health crisis. And my then partner, now wife, Laura, said to me, honey, you just have to evolve out of this fear. Uh, and, and you need to understand the healing properties of having a dog in your life. She's a, a wonderful rescue mama. And we have three at the moment at home. Um, and so I, I decided now is the time. And I adopted Lily. But I have to confess, Afi, I adopted Lily in part because I took pity on her. You see, Lily was old and blind. Now, those are labels, and they're not untrue. She was, factually speaking, old and blind. But, and this is the key point, she was so much more than that. Indeed, she was the most independent-minded being I've ever had the pleasure of being around. The wind would blow one way, Lily would stick her nose up into it, I would clap for her to come back to mama, and she would go further into the wind. <laughs> Take that as you will. Um, one, one quick story, one that I think just really you know, ca encapsulates Lily's personality and the idea of manipulating people, which is what I was doing, trying to do to Lily. One afternoon, uh, I smeared peanut butter all over my lips. Lily loved peanut butter, as do I, I must confess, so it wasn't a great sacrifice. But I was trying to lure a kiss out of Lily. She was kind of sparing with her affection. Well, she smelled the peanut butter, she got up close, until she realized that this was a ploy, at which point she pivoted and walked away keeping her dignity in the teeth of my pathetic scheme to manipulate her. And it was in that moment that I realized, oh gosh, isn't this what we human beings do to one another? 
we, we try to get something out of each other by manipulating only to realize down the road that in fact nobody likes to be played and that often in manipulating we sow the seeds of backlash down the road. Well, let's talk about being played because I went to see Us on Monday. I'm the, not going, the, the, movie, the movie Us. And I'm not going to give the spoiler alert. I'm not going to spoil it. But I am going to say that by the end of the movie, when I saw the surprise ending, I walked out of there very angry because I felt like I had been played. But a, a key theme in the movie is tethering. And as I read back through the book with the notes that I was able to take, I really began to think, in a way, aren't we tethered to the labels that society puts on us? Because I'm always going to be a black woman. I mean, that's just what I am. So you can't, some labels you just can't escape. You know, if you grow up down south, you're a southerner. If you grow up in the Midwest, you're a Midwesterner. So I guess my question is for you, and I hope I'm not being simplistic, what's the issue with what we're tethered to? Right. Um, well, first of all, I agree with the premise that labels aren't going away. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned right up front, this is a trick that the, blame, that the brain rather plays on us. We are thrown every day uh, enormous numbers of bits and bytes of information. The brain would literally quit on us if it had to process every bit of information that we're getting. And so it takes shortcuts. Labels are those shortcuts. And you're right, Afi. Uh, in front of us is a table. That's a label. No matter what other function it has, it will still be a table. So yes, you will still be a black woman. I will still be a queer Muslim. The thing is, though, that I know already, just by reading your Twitter bio, you are so much more than a black woman. You're also a bass player. You've been a reporter. I don't know your backstory, but I am willing to bet that you've got a fascinating one that would allow me to see you as more than just a black woman. And that's the point here, is that it's fine to use labels as starting points. It is not fine if we're really going to appreciate diversity. It is not fine to use labels as finish lines, finish lines that foreclose on the possibility of conversation with your other. But I guess my issue with that is this, as I read through, and your book really is a critique of diversity and especially how the left talks about diversity. I have to admit, I'm very cynical about diversity because in my experience as a black woman with a fascinating backstory, I have gotten to the finish line and not been able to cross over. There are a lot of times, quite frankly, I've wondered if I was brought on the scene simply so I could be the window dressing right. and so people could say, well, you know, hey, we interviewed so-and-so, but in the, in the end, we chose this person. So I, I don't want to say diversity is a sham, but I do want to say diversity has been manipulated. So as I read part of this, I felt like, why is it on us as the people that the labels are attached to to make the mainstream society comfortable? Why can't we hold them accountable? We absolutely can and should hold mainstream uh, uh, society accountable for the labels that are put on us. However, two things I want to say about this, and let me see if I remember the second thing after the first. One is that it's very important how we hold other people accountable. The how matters because if we are going to be shaming, blaming, or gaming people to see us in a particular light, whoever us is, then you can bet that in being shamed, blamed, and gamed, not only will we be opening minds, 
but we'll actually be erecting walls, emotional walls, defensive walls. And that doesn't get us anywhere uh, but backward. And in erecting those walls, um, we also contribute to making diversity a sham. Because, and this is what I've learned over my many years of researching this book, and especially coming to large swaths of the country that are not coastal, i.e. parts of the heartland, parts of the Midwest, the South, and so forth. What I've learned is that many people, and that includes so-called white folks, do feel uh, like, like our kind of diversity has been imposed upon them. And it's not so much a fee, in my experience, that they disagree with diversity. What, in my experience, so many disagree with is um, the, as I call it in the book, the memo that they were never consulted about. Namely, that you can only say these things, that you can, you know, you're not allowed to use these words, and if you ask why not, we'll immediately label you a racist or a misogynist or a homophobe. And if you have questions that rub any of us the wrong way, we will deem you ignorant and insidious. That does not, first of all, not only is that, in my view, uh, inhumane, but it also does not give diversity the good name that it ought to have. So what we have contributed as people who are on the liberal and progressive side of the spectrum, we need to be held accountable for that too. And I understand that, but I'm coming from the historical perspective of a person who was raised in the South during the 60s. There was a very good reason that people were shamed for saying certain things about certain people. I guess I differ from you because I don't necessarily see people being ashamed of saying stuff that's totally inappropriate. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine who just graduated from law school talked about going to a women in law meeting and being asked by a white woman if her children, after she explained she had two boys, if her children's father was still involved with the kids. Now why shouldn't a person like that be shamed? Uh, well, I'll, I'll suggest that it's, again, one thing to say to somebody, you know, I, I find that kind of a curious question. Uh, let me ask you, um, where is that coming from? Um, that's one thing. Quite another to say, you're a racist and I'm offended. Here's why. Ultimately, the question that we have to ask ourselves as the offended ones, is am I trying to open up that person's mind to see me and people such as me in a new light? Or am I interested in my feel-good moment of self-righteousness? If it's the latter, then yeah, go ahead and label, but don't for a minute think that you're gonna be changing the status quo by doing that. On the other hand, my uh, research and not just experience, uh, strongly suggests that if we actually take the time to ask people where they're coming from, what has led them to believe what they believe, and to do it in a way that is inviting rather than intimidating, then not only do we allow ourselves to see that they are more than just this offensive question that they have asked, but that they also then uh, lower their defenses to begin to see us more than just the assumption that they've made. It taps into this approach. Uh, it taps into a fundamental law of human psychology, which is this. If you want to be heard, you must first be willing to hear. And I understand that. I guess um, my, my consistent question as I read through the book is, why is it, why is the burden of listening on us? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I came up through 1962 in Nashville when we had white only and black only signs. My family didn't march because my mother was not nonviolent, but we boycotted stores for Easter. I didn't get Easter presents. Mm -hmm. We didn't go to the movies because we still had, you know, black only sections and 
black only uh, colored at that time entrances and throughout my life I've heard you know I've I've heard this push you know you it, you know make them understand you and so I guess my feeling is when do I don't want to say they <laughs> But when does the other side have to do the work too? When do they have to meet me halfway? I don't know that for me, mm -hmm. the question is when do they have to meet me halfway? I think that the question I'm working in the book with is, will they even meet me halfway if I'm merely pointing fingers? Um, and so, Back to your original question, um, why should the burden be on us, meaning perhaps in this case people of color? Right. I don't for a minute suggest that the burden is on us only. What I am suggesting, and in fact saying, is that it is those who want change who have to initiate change. And the change that you may want and that I may want may ultimately have to come from people other than us. But we have to change ourselves in order to open up their hearts. And I'm being therefore, again, not trying to be morally superior about any of this. I'm saying that I think Dr. King had, a, had an incredibly important insight when he pointed out that humiliating your so-called opponent will only uh, drive them to close up further. And so this is as much about being strategic mm -hmm. as it is you know, about um, changing um, the status quo from which we operate. One final thought here. Um, in the book, I do address what is called systemic discrimination. Okay. Now, when I hear that phrase, and it's bandied around a lot in progressive circles and academic circles, I'm <coughs> often told, Irshad, you know, individuals uh, can change all you want them to, but that won't make a dent in the systemic discrimination that exists in this country, meaning institutions and structures and systems. My question is, but structures and systems and institutions don't speak for themselves. It is we who inhabit those systems who speak on its behalf. So ultimately, it is still people who have to change in order for systems to change. But at the same time, Ishad, let's be real. We have a media landscape that is invested yeah. in shaming, humiliation, and division. A lot of people get a lot of clicks. Oh yeah. A lot of people get a lot of web traffic. So, as as I read through, I saw that you had given examples of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Right. And I understand that. But we're getting our news from Facebook mm -hmm. now news organizations are moving toward AI and algorithm-driven stories. Um, there are a couple of sites, let me just be real, I know we've been streamed, stream. I don't read The Root anymore. I used to report for The Root. Uh -huh. I don't read The Root anymore. Explain to the audience okay. what The Root is. The Root is an online site, it's a vertical that was part of the Washington Post several years ago. I think it's spun off and it's independent, right. but it has changed from original reporting about black oriented issues to more punditry and in my opinion as a journalist very click baited punditry on the latest racial outrage um, and that that's how I'm gonna leave it mm -hmm. the latest racial outrage but that's part of mm -hmm. an industry yes you have that on the right and the left correct so if you're being fed content and news that aligns with your values mm -hmm. because of the way the platforms you know filter yeah. based on your likes I mean they know what your gender you is bet. they know everything about you go back and look at what Facebook knows about you you will be shocked how can we as individuals then <laughs> begin to dismantle a structure that I fear is bigger and stronger than us it is definitely bigger, this structure. Is it stronger? 
That really is up to us. And, and as you know, Afi, there's a huge part of the book in which Lily and I address the manipulation, not just that media indulge in, that almost goes without saying, but that tech companies indulge in as well. I mean, remember, they have designed and continue to design uh, digital technologies um, in a way that deliberately amps up our emotions. And when our emotions are amped up, it is nearly impossible, nearly impossible, to, um, uh, to, to do any reflection, particularly self-reflection. And so uh, one of the conversations I always have with my nieces and nephew, who are adorers of their screen time, mm -hmm. they love their screen time, and rather than lecture them about why you know, they might want to go out and play or have face-to-face -face interaction with people, um, I ask them how they feel about being manipulated by companies, right down to the seven-year-old, my seven-year-old niece. And at first, she of course wondered, well, what do you mean by that? First of all, what does manipulated mean, right? So we talked about it. Then of course the question became, well, what do you mean that the people who, who give the, us these things are manipulating us? So we had a conversation about that. And every once in a while, I'll ask them, what is it that you're learning about yourself in what you like on uh, social media, what you don't like, what you want to share with your friends? All of these questions, not statements, questions, give them a sense, as it should, that they have a degree of free will to make choices of their own. I haven't found a better approach to teaching than to asking questions. If I'm simply telling them that um, you know, you're being played by Facebook, um, that's me lecturing to them. Let watch it just sail right over their heads and never want to have another conversation with their auntie again, right? But when I'm giving them the autonomy to think about these things on their own and not just with me, I can already tell you it's having an impact on them. And, and this is why I really believe that if we're going to raise a new generation to do diversity honestly, meaning be able to tame the impulsive part of the brain long enough to get past just their emotions and begin thinking about their role in any relationship, including the relationship that they have with technology, then it's going to be the educators who will be uh, responsible for introducing these questions to them. Parents, I would love to believe that parents will take the time to do that. I'm not convinced. Educators don't have much time either these days, this much I know. But I also know that they have chosen the profession of educating for a reason, often for a deeply personal reason. And it is in those small epiphanies that the meaning of their profession is brought back to them. I'm going to stop here and check in with the City Club. It's five after one. Is it time for questions now? Uh, Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. <laughs> Good timing. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a forum with Urshad Manji, and she is <coughs> engaged in a dialogue with Afi Scruggs. <coughs> Urshad Manji is a founder of the Moral Courage Academy and author of Don't Label Me, an Incredible Conversation for Divided Times. She's in conversation and will answer questions in a moment. So this is the time for you to formulate your questions. We welcome questions from everyone in the room here, uh, members, guests, students, and so forth, or those who <coughs> are joining us via live stream. If you'd like to tweet, beyond my scope, but if you'd like to <laughs> tweet a question, please do so by tweeting The City Club. 
at the City Club. And our staff will try to work your question into the format. Holding the microphone today are Marketing and Outreach uh, Coordinator Julia Wang and uh, City Club Interim uh, intern, excuse me, inter intern, really Amelia Osanya over here, and uh, they will uh, come to you with the microphone. May we have the first question, please? Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you, first of all, so much for what you said about uh, asking questions of young people. Um, I taught for 40 years, and that's a very important part of, of any kind of teaching. Um, my question, I appreciate the story about uh, having a feel-good moment, you know, when someone says uh, the story of uh, fathers are absent, aren't fathers absent. My question is, when is it okay to realize that the person is a racist? Mm -hmm. uh, when they say to you, well, you know, I heard, you know all you people never have fathers in the, in the, in the home, is it okay for me to call them a racist then? Or do I have to keep on being humble and yeah. patient and not having a feel-good moment? Merle, you certainly don't need my permission to say anything you'd like to. So let's just get that out of the way. But I do understand the spirit of the question. Yeah, obviously, sometimes you have to walk away. Um, all I'm asking is that we not walk away prematurely. And let me explain what I mean by that. One of the through lines of Don't Label Me, the one of the running stories in it, is a story of two young people, Genesis and Lewis. Uh, both of them born and raised in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, Genesis is a hip hop artist, biracial. Uh, her grandfather uh, was uh, murdered by the KKK. Uh, Lewis is a white guy, um, new Genesis from elementary school, so way back when. Um, and he is the descendant of a Confederate soldier who fought for the South and therefore for slavery in that time. One evening, Genesis is giving a concert in New York City, and um, she decides to do something quite provocative. Uh, she wants to protest Confederate Heritage Month. And she puts a noose around her neck. And she whips out the Mississippi state flag, which has Confederate era symbolism in it. And she holds a lighter under it. And the crowd goes nuts. They want her to you know, burn this, this thing. Not wanting to burn down the venue or imperil anybody, she simply throws the flag into the audience and asks them to rip it up. Meanwhile, of course, someone has taken a photo of her you know, placing the noose around her neck. The photo goes viral. She gets death threats, hate mail, you name it. In the midst of that uh, flood of feedback is a, a message from Lewis. Now remember, they haven't known each other for, or been, uh, been in touch with each other, I should say, for some 23 years at that point. But she remembers his name, and he says he disagrees with her on the flag. She shouldn't have to die for her position, but he disagrees with her. What does Genesis do? He could, she could have said, well, you know, buzz off, dude, because I know people like you, and frankly, you're never going to change. Instead, she invites him to her backyard, pours him a glass of lemonade. They sit down and they talk it out. She asks him, how does the Mississippi state flag make you feel? He says, it feels like I'm being welcomed home. How does it make you feel? And she explains. And over the course of an afternoon, completely unscripted, where trust had to be built in the moment, it wasn't already there, Lewis realizes something. No word of exaggeration here. He still wants the flag to stay as it is. But he realizes that he actually cares more about Genesis than he does about this flag. 
So notice he hasn't changed his position on the flag. He's changed how he sees Genesis. And over the course of the next several months, Lewis decides for himself that not only will he support the movement that Genesis is a part of to replace the Mississippi state flag, but that he himself will take down the Confederate flag that is flying in his backyard and put it away in a box labeled the past. This is what I mean by not assuming that because somebody takes a position that is contrary and indeed offensive to yours, or that somehow something that has come out of their mouth, however premeditated it may sound, is indeed their essence. By not assuming that and giving them just enough time to understand their backstory, where they're coming from and why they believe what they believe, it's at that point that I think it would be fair to ask yourself, is that offensive remark what this person is about? If I had their backstory, might I feel the same as they do? And make no mistake, by giving them that time, you have just planted the seed of moral reciprocity. When Genesis asked, how does the Mississippi state flag make you feel? Lewis explained, and then he asked her, how about you? His exact words, how about you? And that opened up the conversation. So yeah, some people are racist. Some are. And you'll find that out soon enough, right? But you might also be surprised that when you take a deep breath and slow jam that impulsive brain and ask them questions, from a sincere place of wanting to know, of being curious, I know I have often been surprised by how much more I learn both about them and about me. Hi, my question is about the role of truth, if there is such a thing in this whole conversation. A label is, you're a black woman, you'll always be a black woman. There are stereotypes, which is like, okay, what does black woman mean? That becomes something else. My truth may be, I mean, I'm not a black woman. I've never been one, probably won't ever be one. But uh, my truth may be different from someone else's truth. Right. And there's also a collective truth. How does the truth fit in to this whole thing? I understand the one-on-one -on -one conversations, but what's the role of truth? It's a great question. What role, if any, does truth play? Um, some of you may know the name Brooke Gladstone. She's the media critic uh, with NPR. She and, um, uh, right, and, she and uh, another journalist uh, host a podcast and a show called On the Media. Well, Brooke Gladstone wrote, um, I'm going to promote somebody else's book here, um, wrote a brilliant little book uh, called The Trouble with Reality. And in it, she points out, and she's coming from the place of a, of a liberal journalist, uh, she points out that every one of us brings a certain frame to facts. So facts exist, absolutely. But that doesn't mean much. Because some people will play up this fact and not that fact, and other people will play up that fact and not this fact, which is to say that we all bring meaning to facts, and that is where the real disagreement is. This is exactly why it does matter to take the time to engage with somebody who you passionately disagree with, because even if you agree on the facts, and that's if these days, right? You want to know why they bring a certain interpretation to what is to you so obviously not that interpretation. And it's only in allowing them to explain that context that you begin to see, wow, not always, of course, but sometimes, wow, they're not an idiot. They're not, you know, stupid. I still disagree because my experiences are so different from theirs, but I see that they're coming from a rational place given their backstory. 
And that way, that way, you create the setting in which you can both stand your ground. You don't have to dilute or compromise your truth. But in listening to an opposing truth, you also then set, uh, create the setting in which you stand your ground and at the same time seek common ground. That, I think, is the sweet spot. It does take skill. Happy to tell you that at the end of the book, there are 11 key tips and tactics that will allow you to take this approach, by the way, not just for the sake of you know, political unity, but all of us, let's be honest, have strained relationships with somebody in our family, right? I took this approach with my own mother at a time when I didn't think there was hope for a close relationship between us. And by not trying to fix her, instead, by fixing myself first, i.e., applying to myself the very advice I had for her, the relationship transformed. It is pretty surprising what this simple approach will do, both to heal relationships and to empower or equip those people with whom you've healed that relationship that then pass it on to others. <clears throat> Don't look to politicians to bring us unity. It really does have to start from the bottom up. But it doesn't mean agreeing with those whom you fundamentally disagree with. It does mean seeing them in a new light, which, by the way, is what respect means in Latin, to turn around and see again. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting. I have a question regarding, I understand the value and the um, possibilities that come from sitting one-on-one -on -one with somebody over an afternoon in the backyard. But so much of our time is spent instantaneously interacting with right. each other. And quite frankly, I find that in given situations, I don't have the opportunity to say, no, you misunderstood me. And I may be very offended by something initially that someone else says. And I can go back and take a step back and try to ask them. But oftentimes, we don't have that time. So I guess my question is, as a person who tries to be very sensitive and empathetic to everybody, there are times I say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So how do we get around that with you know, not labeling, not stereotyping? What are some of the suggestions that you would have so that when I walk out of a room, people aren't going, oh, can you believe what she said? Right. That's right. my question. Wow. That's a nice turning of the tables. I like that. Um, it, it, people, look, people will say whatever they want to say. Uh, that's just the sorry fact of us human beings that even when you are trying to be non-judgmental, you will be judged for being non-judgmental, OK? So, so let's just understand the reality that your job is not to avoid being judged. You can't control other people, nor should you want to, by the way. That then leads to manipulating and the seeds of blowback being planted. You can only control yourself. And so in those moments when something has spilled out of your mouth, that you, know, you think to yourself, ooh, that came out clumsily, there, it's no skin off your nose to say, whoa, that came out clumsily. I'm sorry about that. Um, let me rephrase what I meant to say. Even that one second of time that you've given yourself to then explain what you really meant allows your impulsive brain to shift. And you've given your brain that one necessary second to get past the fear and the anxiety that comes with feeling like you've you know, been misunderstood so that you can actually tap the more evolved part of your brain. It, again, it sounds deceptively simple to take that breath. But in fact, it is not decept deceptive at all. Simple it is. 
but it's not deceptive. But the reason more of us don't do that is that biologically, it is in our nature to uh, jump at whatever the immediate threat is. Keep in mind, your brain cannot distinguish between mortal danger, which is what our ancestors on the savanna experienced, mortal danger from anything that moved. Our brain today still cannot distinguish between mortal danger and mere discomfort, which is why you have to outsmart your own brain. And you do that by taking a deep breath, and if necessary, another one, and doing it intentionally so that you're uh, decelerating the rush of blood in your body. And that will give you a beat of time to then be able to say, I, I think I was misunderstood. Let me explain. I see a question before you go. There was a lady in the table at the very back who had her hand up. Could you, do you mind going to her? Because she's been waiting patiently. And then I'll. Good moderator, this one. <laughs> very good. Um, I wonder, Irshad, have you observed any generational differences here? I, I was just thinking about the special section in the New York Times this last week and about Generation Z. Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah, with all the pictures saying uh, this is the most diverse generation right. in so many ways ever in the United States. Um, and I would like to think that the younger generations, and there's more than one of them, That's but right. especially that one, maybe don't fall victim to some of this labeling quite as um, easily as their elders? So um, what was interesting about that feature, and again, I, I'm not spoiling it for anyone in saying this, is that so many of the young people who were very quickly profiled um, in their own words, so many of them implied that they don't like to be labeled. But there's a problem. And the problem is that they are also change makers or want to be. And today, in many activist circles, including social justice circles, of which I am a part, there is labeling of the other. There is labeling of the evil Republicans. There is labeling of uh, you know, the racist uh, fraternity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That is where my hope dilutes. And so my ultimate hope is that before these kids get too far into college and university, and in fact, if I had my druthers, before they graduate from high school, there will be some mentoring uh, in the skills of moral courage. Why moral courage? Moral courage, as Dick Pogue mentioned, is doing the right thing in the face of your fear. Most people fear being judged negatively. And that's why groupthink is such a powerful force. That if I just stick with my tribe, if I just go along with the consensus, then at least I won't be judged negatively from my own. But in going with the flow, often, you're actually failing to do the right thing. So um, this is the kind of education that, for what it's worth, you know, the Moral Courage Academy uh, not only offers, but also works with other teachers to provide in schools. And um, for anybody who's listening to this uh, podcast today, um, I, I want to just affirm, it is absolutely true that teachers have too much on their plates as it is. But my simple case for teaching moral courage is this. We don't know what the economy or politics or technology will be like 10, 15 years from now. We don't know. What we do know is that whatever your vision of progress, you're going to have to get people who are not yet on side to buy in. And that means learning how to engage with people who disagree with you rather than just labeling them. I'd like so, to interrupt here. Yeah. Because what came to mind is that what we are seeing now, in my opinion, is the rise of demagoguery on both sides. For sure. So 
you know, it's going to be more than, I think, getting people to agree with you. It's going to be as much learning how to combat very good demagogues. Absolutely right, uh, Afi, absolutely right. And in, um, in cooperation with your point, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the way in which we engage will be as important a tool to combat demagoguery at a high level as the words themselves or as the actions themselves. You know, um, diversity, if indeed we want to have it, will take diverse approaches. But how then do you convince the person who sees you as the evil one, how do you convince them to just let down their guard long enough to listen to what you have to say? My argument is you do it best and most efficiently, believe it or not, efficiently, by first listening to what they have to say. Asking them questions based on what you've just heard, not as a gotcha tactic, but out of sincerity, because you really do think that they have something to teach you. And why do you think they have something to teach you? Because if nothing else, they are teaching you what their values are, which in turn gives you the information you need to frame your own arguments in a way that they might finally hear. So in fact, both from a moral and a strategic perspective, I would argue that this kind of diversity, moving past your label for them, and, and engaging to get their point of view, so it's diversity of viewpoint, not just diversity of complexion and religion and you know, uh, gender and so forth, diversity of viewpoint will be key to role modeling the very vision that does combat demagoguery, both on the right and on the left. Let me interrupt. It is 1.27. Do we have one more question? We have time for one more question. And keep in mind, folks, I'll be at the reception afterwards right. so you can get one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five time with me as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, given the time, I was tempted to frame this with a long explanation. Instead, I'll just ask the straightforward question. How optimistic are you? Can we do this going forward? Do things, does the future look bright in your view, or is it going to get worse before it gets any better? Oh, it'll get worse, in my view, before it gets better. Certainly. Um, and, uh, and again, that's for all of the structural reasons that Afi mentioned. The way media cover issues in a way that is uh, intended to manipulate you into giving them your ears and eyeballs. Uh, the fact that technology is a reality that is not going away, and therefore uh, a for-profit tech company will always want to design its technologies to you know, really play up your emotional side. So for all of those reasons and more, yep, it's going to get worse. Exactly why I think the effort to raise a generation to practice honest diversity, listening to diverse viewpoints, and not just looking for diverse skin colors. The honest diversity is a lifelong effort. So what are we, what, why are we wasting time? Let's get it started. Let's be talking to our nieces and nephews. And let's learn from them so that they too realize that they will always have something to learn from somebody else. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a forum with Urshad Manji, founder of the Moral Courage Academy and author of Don't Label Me, an incredible conversation for divided times. She has been in conversation with <clears throat> digital storyteller and former plane dealer reporter Afi Scruggs. Today is the Margaret W. Wong Endowed Forum on Foreign-Born Individuals of Distinction made possible by a generous endowment grant from Margaret. We are delighted to have several representatives from her firm here today, and we thank you for coming and supporting this, this uh, program. Urshad also appears as part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. 
We are grateful to all the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through the, this public grant. Our community partners for today's forum are the Cleveland Playhouse and the LGBT Center of Greater Cleveland. We appreciate their partnership. And we welcome guests at tables hosted by Cuyahoga Community College and by Bill Green. We also like to recognize the presence of all of our friends from the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage <clears throat> and some of the winners of the annual Stop the Hate essay contest. Support for student participation at City Club Forums comes from Key Bank and from the William W. Weiss Foundation with additional support from donors that you'll find listed in the program at your table. We thank all of those for being here with us today. The sale of uh, Urshad Manji's book, Don't Label Me, An Incredible Conversation for Divided Times, is provided by a cultural exchange. And so that brings us to the conclusion of today's forum. We thank you, Urshad and Afi. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or Please for podcasts the of the City Club, the go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.